Move that up. Yes, it looks great. Okay. Hi, everybody. This is um, this is to me one of my favorite events at the meeting, and it is the uh, introduction of the um, ACMT Ellenhorn Award for 2022. Um, you may be aware that the Ellenhorn Award is the highest honor given to anybody by ACMT. It's administered to one person every year. And this year, I'm really happy to um, say that the awardee is my good friend, uh, Steve Seifert. When I was asked to give the introduction uh, to the award, I thought that Steve is probably going to be quite likely to outline many things about his professional career. And so perhaps I could supplement it with some things that he might not be talking about in his career. So I set out to find out what I could find, what, what I could actually learn about Steve outside of his career as a medical toxicologist maybe find something amusing, maybe even find something slightly embarrassing. And what I found out is that there is the Steve Seifert that everybody knows, and then there's the Steve Seifert that people don't know. And I'm gonna tell you a little, just for a couple of seconds about the Steve Seifert that you probably don't know. I'm sure many of you are avid readers of the Baseball Research Journal, but just in case you are not, uh, draw your attention to this 1994 paper written by Steve entitled On Batting Order, the Monte Carlo Approach. Actually, when Steve was, as I understand it, approximately 16 years old, he came to the conclusion that the traditional batting order used in baseball is probably suboptimal, but he had to wait many years uh, before he got his first personal computer that he could actually do a Monte Carlo simulation and, act and demonstrate that in fact, his idea was correct and uh, subsequently published it in the journal. Now, I realize not everybody here reads the Baseball Research Journal. Perhaps you spend your time reading the Baker Street Journal, which as you can see here is described as an irregular an irregular quarterly of Sherlock Lana. So basically it's a journal about the writings of Sir Arthur Cannon Doyle um, regarding Sherlock Holmes. And there, as you see in this 2001 version of the Baker Street Journal, one will, one will find the paper uh, by Steve on, that, that catalogs all the various poisons and poisonous plants that Holmes discovered as causes of the various murders he was investigating. Now, when I first found this picture of Steve, I thought, well, this is basically the way he rejects papers from Clintox. But in fact, turns out that Steve is a uh, black belt in Taekwondo. And while we were on the, while we're on the subject of um, physical activity, let me tell you something about Steve that's very near and dear to my heart, which is that Steve is a very, is, it has been in various times in his life, a very active bicyclist. As a matter of fact, he has completed several, uh, what, are, what, what are called century rides, over hundred mile rides. And I can tell you as a bicyclist, these are, these are really hard to do. But I think, you know, for anybody who knows Steve outside of his professional life, probably the one thing they might know about is the, is the Steve Seifert project. Steve, uh, as you can see up in the right-hand corner, is a um, musician. He, he describes himself as not being very good, but actually, if you click on this uh, YouTube link, uh, he, he's, he's truly not bad at all. And in fact, he what he did is he, collected a variety of musicians around the country, all interestingly, that sharing the name Steve Seifert, uh, playing different instruments, formed, this, formed this, uh, this little musical group called the Steve Seifert Project. And that's actually who's playing um, on, the, on this YouTube video. But for all of these things, for all of this, these aspects of his life, we really know Steve Best as a medical toxicologist. And as you can see there, as a medical toxicologist, he has um, 
He has a particular interest in snake bites. We all, everybody probably knows him now best as the editor in chief of, uh, of Clintox. And you know, we all love to get letters from Steve telling us that our latest paper in Clintox has been accepted. As an editor, Steve is somewhat of a linguistic purist. And as a matter of fact, from what I am told, he's a linguistic purist around his staff, for example, at the Poison Center as well, because uh, they actually have some fun with this from time, from time to time, talking about the wisdom of Steve uh, Seifert with, with some of his favorite things he, uh, he tells his staff. For example, for the last time, AST and ALT are not liver function tests. And he's actually right about that. Or one that they really like, we really should stick to generic names whenever possible. I know that Kepper is easier to say than Leviteracetam, but that, that, that. But as a linguistic purist, he, he, he serves the journal Clintox very well. We're about to hear now from Steve about his career. I regard him as one of the uh, world's experts on snake bites, and I'm sure we're gonna be hearing about this uh, now. So Steve, we're looking forward to your talk. Well, uh, can you hear me? Loud yes, you sound great. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that marvelous and slightly embarrassing introduction. Um, let me see if I can share my slides. Uh, you should be seeing my title slide. Yes, we look, it looks great. Okay, well, thank you again. That was uh, really marvelous. Um, and I also wish to thank the members of the selection committee, the ACMT board of directors, Dr. Wax, the administrative staff of the, of the ACMT uh, for this tremendous honor. Uh, first, my disclosures. Uh, I, I don't think I actually have any conflicts of interest, but I was being thorough. And I will mention the Venom Week symposiums and I'm on the board of the North American Society of Toxinology, their primary sponsor, but NAST is a 501c3 nonprofit entity and the meetings are likewise nonprofit events. And the learning objectives, uh, I'll talk about envenomations, medical publication and editing a little bit, the importance of mentors and the role of unfortunate happenstance and serendipity. I have a connection to Matt Ellenhorn. Many of you know he died towards the end of writing uh, the second edition of his textbook. Rick Dart took up the mantle, edited the third edition, in which I authored 15 chapters. I was proud to have carried on the work that Matt began. When I look at this list of prior Ellenhorn recipients, I'm awed to be in the company of these incredibly accomplished people most of whom I, I know or have known, and with many of whom I have collaborated. In preparing this address, I had to ask myself, what do I have a value to offer? I mean, is there anything unique? My grandmother always told me that I was unique, just like everybody else. Uh, but the one thing that is uniquely mine is the story of my journey from the start of my career to this point. And it has been somewhat meanderingly uh, chaotic. So I will relate some anecdotes from which I have taken lessons, both positive and negative. And that's the element of originality I think I bring. Do you have to be an iconoclast to reach this point? And I don't think that I am, not for lack of trying. All of my life, I've tried to come up with original ideas, but I have found over and over again that whenever I think I have an original idea, Eventually, I discovered that someone had it before me. Even my idea about batting order, um, I ultimately discovered uh, had been discovered by a Dick Hall, a major league baseball player some 10 years before I had the idea. And you'll also see that whatever my accomplishments, they were grounded in previous work and achieved mostly in collaboration with others. And although I've concentrated my academic output in certain areas, uh, primarily in venomations and antivenoms, 
my path to this point has been all over the map, figuratively and literally. Uh, I didn't know the meaning of the word peripatetic until someone used it to describe me. Uh, and perhaps my willingness to move for advancement has played a role. It was a chance remark by my cousin about land grant institutions in New York having in-state tuition that allowed me to be able to afford to attend Cornell University's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. I went as a biology major and I knew that I'd be applying to medical school, something that had been my goal since at least the age of three. But this was a particularly difficult time to get into medical school. There was a war on. Every male had to register for the draft. And the only post undergraduate deferment being drafted and possibly being sent to Vietnam was medical school. And suddenly everybody wanted to be a doctor. The traditional ratio of applicants to medical school slots went from two to one to five to one in the year I was applying. And it's likely that a Cornell degree helped me get into medical school, in part because I was a lazy student. I only worked hard at the things I enjoyed, and I slacked off in subjects that didn't interest me. And as a result, as my college years progressed, my GPA was, shall we say, lackluster. And I was in danger of not getting into medical school. And then I was lucky enough to find the first of my many mentors. Mo Elderfrawi, a professor of biology, took me into his lab doing binding studies on the acetylcholine receptor in electric eels. I learned about how science was conducted. I gained theoretical and bench science skills. I conducted research for an honors thesis under his guidance and obtained my first scientific publications. On these strengths, plus good MCATs, some frenetic coursework to raise my GPA, I was accepted into the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. You would think I'd have learned a lesson about study habits, but sometimes the only second chance you get is a chance to make the same mistakes again. Alas, that thought is not my original one either. That's David Mamet. In medical school, the first two years were pretty dry and not exciting, and I put in just enough to get by until I arrived on the wards in my junior year. I can't explain why it hadn't occurred to me before, <laughs> but I suddenly became aware I was responsible for people's health, for their very lives. What I knew or did not know was critical to their outcomes. And that was a moment that changed everything in my approach to learning. Suddenly, it had a purpose. Suddenly, it was important. And under this responsibility, I went from being a slacker to becoming a lifelong learner. Thought I wanted to be a family physician. And after medical school, I found myself in a family medicine residency at the University of Arizona in Tucson. But after a short while, I realized it wasn't a good fit for me. But I had no idea of what field I wanted to go into. I gave my notice in November. Uh, and going into June of that year, I still had no idea. The final month of my internship was a rotation in the emergency department, something I had not encountered before that. The first three days of which were with Doug Lindsay as my attending and my next mentor. In addition to being a great clinician and teacher, he was also a believer in giving awards, little paper gold stars for good work. After those first exhilarating days under his tutelage, multiple stars on my name tag, including one for helping to save the life of one of our staff gastroenterologists having a severe bee sting allergic reaction, I knew I'd found a calling. There were few EM residencies in those days, fewer than 10 in the country. So after my internship, I embarked on a crash course to learn emergency medicine from textbooks, a short course at the University of Colorado from my colleagues. And I started just working as an emergency physician because you could do that in those days. I progressed from a small rural hospital with a four bed ED to a busy suburban hospital in Omaha where we'd moved to my wife's nursing school, to a level one trauma center in Phoenix, and then back to the University of Arizona Hospital in Tucson where I joined the emergency medicine faculty just in time for the start of an EM residency there and a chance at an academic career. I had an appointment as an assistant professor. I did some research for a pharmaceutical company, wanted to market a new NSAID, 
wrote some review papers and presented small investigator initiated studies at regional and national medical conferences. But I was incompletely trained and I didn't have the skills needed of a clinician scientist. I wasn't really developing the kind of academic portfolio that would result in promotion. My CV over a seven year period was quite scanty. And it's even less impressive when you realize that one of my presentations was in the SAEM Humorous Abstract Competition. When the university took over the county uh, emergency department at Kino Community Hospital, I saw it as a chance to move into a non-academic role. And I went to Kino as the acting chair of emergency medicine there. And I acquired some administrative skills. But when my daughter was born, I made the decision to reduce my hours to half time. I'd always lived below my means, so I had the economic freedom to do that. And combined with my wife's part-time work, one of us was always home and available to bring up our child without needing additional childcare. And that's something I've never regretted. A few years later, my daughter was entering school. I had more available time. And as it happened, the university had lost the EV contract and it was offered to me. This was an opportunity to be the head of a physician group, and I threw myself into that, adding the business of emergency medicine and the politics of medicine within a healthcare system to my store of experiences. We still had EM residents rotating through the emergency department. I supervised, I did some teaching, but my career as an academician was officially over, and it was officially a failure. At Keno, we saw a large number of sexual assaults. In one year, I found myself doing about a dozen such exams. And when the county hired a tough new sex crimes prosecutor who wouldn't offer the usual plea bargains, I found myself testifying in court in a number of those. She invited me to join the board of directors of the Southern Arizona Center Against Sexual Assault, along with Nora Gilray, a California trained forensic nurse examiner who had just fortuitously moved to Tucson. We recruited and trained nurses to create the first forensic sexual assault nurse examiner program in the state. I served as its first volunteer medical director. And I was then asked by the governor to serve on a statewide task force to develop a similar program in Phoenix. And for this work, I wound up with a number of community volunteer awards. And although they were validating, they were just a footnote to my satisfaction in having done something of value. The saying of the time was, bloom where you're planted, and I think I did that, but I was also open to moving around as opportunities arose. One day, as I was going about seeing patients in the EV at Kino, I received a phone call from Rick Dart, seen here uh, sometime before that in his emergency medicine residency. I might also point out Judith Brillman in the middle, uh, just to the left, a longtime emergency medicine faculty member at the University of New Mexico, where I work, who helped me edit an early version of this talk. And she's standing next to a rather <clears throat> scruffy version of me when I was on the faculty. So Rick was my resident. And he had long since completed his EM training uh, when he called me and, and also completed a fellowship in medical toxicology and his PhD. And he was moving to Denver to become the director of the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center. But he was also about to start a clinical trial of a new crotalinate antivenom, which would be later branded as Crofab or Fab antivenom. In Denver, he wouldn't be seeing many rattlesnake bites, but Keno Hospital, where I work, did. He remembered I once had academic ambitions, but I like to be a site principal investigator on the project. This is one of the moments on which my entire life pivoted. I could have said no, it was fine in that moment. If I, if I had had a tattoo at that point, it would have been just say no. And there was no need to complicate my life. But among the lessons I had learned from my experiences was to reject that initial impulse. And I said, yes. The introduction of the first antivenom in the US antivenom crotalidate polyvalent was an IgG. And that had been a major advance. Deaths plummeted for more than 100 a year to fewer than 10. Still, this IgG antivenom had been approved without human studies and had its drawbacks, namely a high rate 
of hypersensitivity reactions. The introduction of fab antivenom then was a modern approach, crafting fab fragments from the IgG of a host animal, in this case sheep, by treating it with papain and purifying the final product to remove the antigenic FC chain, producing an effective and much safer antivenom. It was also the first antivenom anywhere to undergo a prospective clinical trial, and this would mark a significant advance in snake envenomation management. But now something happened that no one really had anticipated. We began to see a phenomenon of recurrent effects. And after apparent initial control by the antivenom, local effects, progressive proximal swelling, recurred first in about half the patients, eight of 16 in the PRN dosing group here. And hematological effects from the cytopenia and or hypofibrinogenemia also recurred in about half the patients in our cohort. Only that happened between four and seven days after treatment when the patients had already gone home. The clinical implications were frightening since as you can see, uh, the recurrent effects could be profound. We had to resolve these issues before continuing the clinical trial and an investigators meeting was called. We documented the phenomenon. We determined that local recurrence was not related to recurrent venom in the serum. It was most likely related to antivenom falling below a certain threshold arriving at the junction between normal and envenomated tissue. And if you gave more antivenom, you could prevent or stop further local tissue injury. By the end of 24 hours, those cytotoxic venom components were all used up. However, hematologic recurrence like this did seem related to the recurrence of venom in the bloodstream or venomemia. Here's an example we saw in a patient with an initial platelet count of 12,000. Uh, there was measurable venom concentration. We gave antivenom. The venom concentration dropped to zero. Then the thrombocytopenia resolved. But then we had a drop in the free fab levels. Venom concentrations became measurable once again, and we had a recurrence in thrombocytopenia. Finally, we gave additional free fab. Uh, we gave additional fab, which increased the amount of free fab available to bind and neutralize venom that disappeared and the thrombocytopenia resolved. We developed theoretical models of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics to explain this. These next two slides are idealized graphs that I developed to demonstrate the smaller volume of distribution of an IgG resulting in slow decline and greater persistence of high serum antivenom levels and the larger volume of distribution and shorter half-life of FAB resulting in a more rapid decline of antivenom concentrations initially uh, and then uh, late recurrence of anemia. We thought hematologic recurrence was a new finding, but Rick Dart pulled all of the post-discharge lab data he could find in patients treated with the older IgG antivenom. And he showed that this actually occurred in 45% of those patients for whom value, lab values were available. The lack of clinical follow-up of snake bite patients in general, and the milder degree of these recurrences had allowed this phenomenon to go unnoticed until then. So what we'd actually demonstrated was that recurrence was an effect common to immunoglobulin-based antivenoms because of a mismatch between the pharmacodynamics and the pharmacokinetics of antivenom and unneutralized venom. IgG-based antivenom resulted in the lowest incidence and had generally the mildest form since it had the smallest volume of distribution and the longest half-life. Fab antivenom had an exaggerated form of it because of its larger volume of distribution and short half-life. Fab 2 would turn out to be the sweet spot. With my pharmacologic background, and along with Rick Dart and Leslie Boyer, then the director, medical director of the Arizona Poison and Drug Information Center, and the site principal investigator at the University of Arizona, and with others who'd been involved in the study, we developed a revamping of the snake bite management protocols, trying to better match the kinetics of the antivenom to the venom. Leslie became another important mentor to me as I got a close look at what medical toxicologists and poison centers did. And no one said that mentors have to be older than you. We began presenting and publishing our findings. 
which led me to the North American Congress of Clinical Toxicology, a meeting that as an emergency physician, I might otherwise never have attended. At my first NAC meeting, I realized that I had finally, finally found my tribe and my true passion. And uh, things got off to a good start. At my third NAC, I asked Rick Dart what he thought of my going back into a fellowship in medical toxicology. Not surprisingly, he thought it was a great idea. He joked that I would never find work. Jobs are scarce in medical toxicology, but he thought it was a great idea nevertheless and a good fit for me. And so at the age of 47, and after a 20 year career in emergency medicine, and again, because I'd always lived below my means and could afford to take a step back, Rick Dart, who'd been my resident, would now become my fellowship director. I crafted my own fellowship. You could do that in those days. And I flew from Tucson to Denver periodically to the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center. And then I took graduate courses at the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy and worked at the Arizona Poison and Drug Information Center under Leslie's preceptorship whenever I was back home in Tucson. After my fellowship, I was still practicing emergency medicine and volunteering at the Arizona Poison and Drug Information Center. One day, standing there after morning rounds, one of the spies looked up and said, I'm talking to someone who says he's the cultural preservation officer on the Hopi reservation. He's asking all these weird questions about pesticides. I really think you should talk with him. And so I did, because when a spy says that I should talk with someone, I do. Turns out, funerary, ceremonial, and objects of cultural patrimony belonging to the tribe were being repatriated from museums around the country as a result of NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. However, the cultural preservation officer had just gotten his monthly copy of a natural history magazine, and in an article on artifact preservation, he saw that curators were handling objects wearing masks and gloves and sometimes gowns and goggles. The tribe had been receiving these objects from museums around the country, but simply putting them back into cultural use. And cultural use for the Hopi, among other things, meant wearing full head leather masks and dancing around in them for many hours. They had no museum. These were being stored in the homes of tribal members. Was there a danger? I didn't know. Leslie Boyer put me in touch with Nancy Odegaard, director of the Arizona State Museum, and David Smith, a chemist at the University of Arizona. And it turned out that objects made of leather or wood or feathers or vegetable matter were subject to insect predation and to protect them, protect them in museum collections in the 1800s, the early 1900s, they were often treated with arsenic or mercury and more recently with other pesticides. Indeed, there was a danger, and this was not just a problem for the Hopi. Almost all of the more than 500 tribes in the US had been receiving these objects from museums under NAGPRA. Few had museums to curate and handle these objects appropriately, and this was actually a national public health issue. We worked with a number of tribes to identify contaminated objects. We published our work, and we made presentations on how such objects should be handled, stored, displayed, or retired. A couple of years after finishing my fellowship and having worked at the Rocky Mountain Poison and Arizona Poison Centers, I knew that I wanted to make a contribution by becoming a medical director of a poison center. And so I was hired to assume that position at the Nebraska Poison Center in Omaha then owned by the private hospital in which it was founded some 47 years before. Although it was a non-academic position, the center had a glorious history. It was co-founded by Tilly McIntyre, its longtime medical director, and a founding member of the AAPCC and an early AAPCC president, and Carol Angle, another of the AAPCC's early presidents, one of the country's early experts on pediatric lead poisoning, one of the first female full professors and department chairs at a medical school and a former editor in chief of clinical toxicology. However, two years after my arrival, financial concerns resulted in a decision by the hospital to close the poison center, threatening me with the loss of my job, of course, 
but more importantly, threatening the people of Nebraska with the loss of their only poison center. And by this time, I fully understood the value and the importance of regional poison centers. I now vowed to try to save it. When I'd arrived in Nebraska, I'd made the rounds and established relationships at the State Department of Health, at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, at Creighton University Medical Center, and elsewhere. You never know where you're going to find like-minded individuals, mentors, and friends. As an example, the dean of the medical school, Jim Armitage, an oncologist, took his family on snake photo safaris every year or two and had a great interest in venomous snakes. I now made the rounds of those individuals again. Richard Raymond, the chief medical officer at the Department of Health, immediately understood what was at stake. He convinced the governor, Mike Johans, to make two years of bioterrorism monies available to whomever took the center. I met with the president of Creighton University, John Schlegel, and although they couldn't afford to support the center entirely on their own, they agreed to chip in a hefty amount annually in its support. I presented the case to Jim Armitage. He convinced the chancellor of the medical center, Al Mar, to thus take in the poison center. In the end, we moved the Poison Center into the University of Nebraska Medical Center, lock, stock, barrel, managing director, nearly every spy, and Pinky the Elephant too. In my efforts to save the Poison Center and dealing with the economics, the personalities, and the politics of the situation, I had to draw on all of the knowledge, experience, and skills that I had developed to that point over the years. Nothing I had ever learned was truly wasted in that moment. In the move into the University of Nebraska Medical Center, I received a tenure track faculty appointment. Since my days on the CROFAB project, continuing through various non academic positions, I had still been doing research, teaching, presenting in conferences, and publishing, not because I was pursuing an academic career that had ended in Tucson, but because of my passion for toxicology. Over that time, outside of an academic appointment, nevertheless, I had developed this, the start of a legitimate academic portfolio. Now back in the fold of academia at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and later, and for the past almost 15 years, uh, as the medical director of the New Mexico Poison and Drug Information Center at the University of New Mexico, I was more than ready to continue that academic career. This time, I was determined not to make the same mistakes twice. I continued and deepened my contributions to the assessment and management of envenomations and the kinetics and dynamics of antivenom. This, for example, was a study on the continuous infusion of FAB in order to maintain a low but continuous neutralizing antivenom concentration. And just for the purposes of CME, I should note this is an off-label use of the product. The need for this approach now is obviated, however, by the availability of an FAB2 antivenom, for which clinical trials I was again a site principal investigator. FAB2 antivenoms are created by treating that IgG with pepsin and cleaving the molecule below the hinge, leaving a larger fragment with a smaller volume of distribution and longer half-life than FAB, eliminating local recurrence and significantly reducing the incidence of hematologic recurrence. With Leslie Boyer and a couple of HRSA grants, I helped to create the online antivenom index to help poison centers manage non-native envenomations. And I did additional research and publishing and education and professional service. I think I've done my best work in the latter portion of my career, if I have to say so myself, by maintaining my passion for what I was doing and being fortunate to work in highly supportive environments at both the University of Nebraska Medical Center and the University of New Mexico. I contributed service in the form of sitting on the boards of the ACMT and the American Association of Poison Control Centers. And over the years, as various opportunities came up, for example, to write a review article in the New England Journal of Medicine, I've long since learned to say yes. A part of how that article came about occurred just a little while after we'd saved the poison center in Nebraska. Jim Armitage, the dean of whom I mentioned, came to me and said, Steve, you know all the snake people around the world. 
how about putting on a scientific snake conference here? Now, at that time, I didn't know anybody outside of my small circle of CROFAB researchers. But at this point, I'd learned to say yes to things, and I didn't want to disappoint. But I had no idea how to do that. How you put on a scientific meeting, an international meeting. Oh, it's easy, he said, becoming my next mentor. He showed me how. We raised seed money from the various academic departments at the university in exchange for discounted future registrations. That was enough money to invite David Warrell at Oxford, one of the most esteemed researchers in venomous snake bite in the world, as a keynote speaker. Once he was on board, we had no difficulty soliciting scientific presentations. And that meeting, Snake Bites in the New Millennium, was a success. Such that two years later, Leslie Boyer took up the mantle and put together the first modern Venom Week meeting on all things venomous. From there, I organized the next two Venom Week meetings and helped to create the North American Society of Toxinology to sponsor future Venom Week meetings. And I served as its first president. Venom Week 8, by the way, will be held this summer, and it's a good feeling to have something that I helped to create now have a life of its own and will hopefully live on well beyond my time. But I wasn't done just yet. I was ready to move my contributions to medical toxicology in a new direction. While I was on the AAPCC board, I'd been appointed to the senior editorial board of clinical toxicology to represent the board to the journal. I ran for presidency of the AAPCC, but I lost that election and was rotating off the board. And Marty Caravati, then the editor in chief, invited me to join the working editorial staff as an associate editor. And Marty mentored me in that role. A few years later, he decided to step down. I got the job as editor in chief. And there is unfortunate happenstance and serendipity for you all over again. Had I won the APCC election, I wouldn't have become an associate editor. And today would not be the editor in chief of clinical toxicology and now in a position to promote global public health. To what degree we are certain in our knowledge, the information that informs our clinical judgment, guides our practice of evidence-based medicine, depends on what's published and how we interpret that information. There's a hierarchy of certainty of knowledge and whether you're contributing to it or just an end user of it. Understanding this is critical to how we do our jobs. I don't do this alone. This job is a study in collaboration, including my predecessors, the authors, the reviewers, the decision editors, the editorial boards, the journal staff, and me, this job is the epitome of a team effort. In addition to mentors and colleagues, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention the importance of family and friends. I've been talking about my professional life, but there's a point of overlap between the personal and the professional spheres. And my accomplishments would have been greatly diminished without the love and support of my parents, Bernard and Beverly, my spouse, Sandy, our child, Sarah, as well as my mentors, other colleagues and collaborators, and the love and support of too many friends to mention by name here. You know who you are, and I thank you most sincerely. So that's how I got from there to here. I contributed to the science. I supported the institutions through which we work. I helped to create other institutions. I contributed to protecting and improving public health and providing and promoting toxicology education. And now I am a custodian of one of the sources of knowledge that we need to practice evidence-based medicine. I've encountered unfortunate happenstance from time to time, but I have found serendipity whenever I was open to it. And it's not just that this is a career achievement award that turns my thoughts to lessons and to legacy. Since time immemorial, people have confronted their mortality, have thought deeply about it, and passed those insights on to others. One of those insights is that time is the true currency of life. I continue doing what I've always done, what we all do in our profession, save lives, alleviate pain and suffering, and advance our understanding of the world because we have found these things to be worthy ways to spend our time, to spend our life's currency. 
Perhaps you're listening to me and wondering how you might get from wherever you are to where I am now. I've been relating my personal journey, but the question comes up, is there a more systematic approach to winning a career achievement award? And so I did my due diligence and searched for that, but I didn't find one. However, as usual, I discovered that I am not the first to tread this ground. I did find this autobiographical essay by Lewis Goldberg entitled, How to Win a Career Achievement Award in Five Easy Lessons. He concludes that you should shave your head, stay healthy, and outlive your competition. While humorous, this kind of misses the point, which is what I've been talking about. It's not about receiving awards, including this one, which I deeply appreciate, but the goal is to do good work and take satisfaction from that. So as I pass on whatever wisdom I think I have found from these anecdotes and other, others in my life, the medical editor in me wants to caution you first that what I've related today is essentially a case report. It has an N of one from which cause and effect cannot be definitively determined. So let's just say that these are the associations I take away from my own experiences. Be passionate about what you do. Let the fulfillment of that passion be your true reward. Learn to just say yes. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but you should be a lifelong learner and nothing you learn or experience is ever truly wasted. Seek out mentors and those who inspire you. You don't have to be an iconoclast. One of the things that makes us human is our ability to learn from and work with each other. Treat everyone with kindness and respect. You never know when a former student will turn out to be your program director. Make friends and connections in the world. Like-minded individuals, mentors, and friends are sometimes found in unlikely places. Medicine's hierarchical structure may falsely lead us to believe that as physicians, we know more than others on the healthcare team. I respect the knowledge and skills of my spies, nurses, pharmacists, and others on the team. One of the smartest people I ever worked with was a security guard at the county hospital, and I benefited from his keen observations and sage advice on more than one occasion. And despite your best laid plans, you may find yourself subject to unfortunate happenstance, and I ask you to be open to serendipity. Don't be afraid to retool your career or your life from time to time. Living substantially below your means will give you the financial freedom to make those choices. And while I'm on the subject of giving financial advice, I'll add that if you're hearing my voice, it's not too soon to start planning for retirement. Thank you.